Okay, thank you very much. I think it's rather clear by now that I am neither the young, beautiful lady sitting on the lake, nor the bearded lawyer gentleman with a book of law. I am no lawyer. For a person who deals with rule of law, I am definitely am no lawyer. I am a student of uh, transitions from extractive to inclusive institutions. So one reason why I am one supplementary reason for which I am so honored is to come to this place one year after James Robinson, because our works very closely relate. What I have done in my work is to take it from where economists like Achimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson left it. They managed to bring this great contribution into showing that the quality of institutions matters for the output, for the public goods production of nation states. Now, however, where they brought this question after this demonstration is that we really have this puzzle before us. We know that this matters. We know that some countries succeeded. And James Robinson contributed uh, the great case study of uh, Britain and how Britain succeeded in doing this. But all our examples are historical, are how some countries which are currently associated with good governance have succeeded in reaching this equilibrium that we call rule of law in the past. What we know far less is how to do this in the future and currently. And this is where the rule of law promotion industry works. Here is what foreign affairs departments fund through development cooperation, is to try to help countries to succeed in this transition. And this is what I have studied. I have studied contemporary transitions to good governance starting with the end of the Second World War. So one of my uh, books, which was not mentioned here because it's not a monograph, it's also covered by me, but in one of my edited books called Transitions to Good Governance, I do exactly this. I look at the very few success stories that we have had after the Second World War to move from extractive to inclusive institutions. So I know it can be done because I have visited myself around the world the 10 countries which succeeded in doing this. But also I know how difficult and uh, is to achieve and sustain this because even from my very few case studies, I am losing every year one, right? So the past two, three years have not been great years. So I'm looking worriedly that no new case studies appear and the old ones, countries like Georgia or Botswana, uh, seem to lose the, their po previously positive acquis. So this is the Transitions to Good Governance book, which I edited jointly with Professor Michael Johnson and, of course, teams of authors from these countries. Okay, but what do I like to do today is not to introduce you in my past work. My past work is there, published and well published, and also I have created a universe of analytical indicators where you can not only look at how countries have done in the past 15 years, but also to get a forecast of what countries will evolve positively or negatively in the future. This is on my website, corruptionrisk.org, for 140 countries. I may show you very little of it today, but that's not what I wanted to talk about, because this is out there already, and everybody, I hope, can find this, because very likely, if you're interested in a country, we will cover it. You know, we don't cover all islands and, and things like this, but we cover a lot of countries. Now, what I would like to talk to you today is, is to discuss in earnest about the difficulty of promoting rule of law. Where we are, why it's going so difficultly, and what we can learn from the experience that we had in the past two, three decades. 
I seem to get a bit of a microphone effect. Should I be closer, further from this? You don't have an echo? Am I clear and distinct? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So what I would like to uh, explain is why is it such a challenge for us to promote rule of law? You see very well that it's a challenge to promote it even within EU, let alone in our neighborhood and in the rest of the world. This is my book, Europe's Burden, in which I looked on the good governance conditionalities of European Union in 127 countries to which we give aid. And I examined the impact that EU has on good governance on old member states, new member states, neighbors, and the rest of the world. So I can really say that I have you know, looked comprehensively, examining all rule of law projects as a statistical population and doing all the relevant case studies. So the first reason for this difficulty is that it's actually not really clear for all of us. We do not all understand the same thing by rule of law. And the concept has really been growing out of proportion since we promoted. It used to have a simpler definition, and now it's becoming a more complex one. The second thing is that that is what I do a lot. I try to create objective instruments. By objective, I understand fact-based instruments, measurements. It's not that people's perceptions do not matter. People's perceptions matter a lot. But in the end of the day, by measuring perceptions of people about the quality of government, we end up invariably by only measuring one thing, which is trust in government. Trust in government is crucial, right? More important than food, as Confucius famously put it. More important than food and more important than security. You cannot outlive if you do not trust the government. A nation state cannot outlive a week. But in order for us to have informed policies, just measuring trust in government is too non-specific. So we have to build more fact-based indicators to understand what we do good and what we do wrong, to be able to have normal policy evaluation. Since we cannot really measure rule of law, we can believe whatever we want, if it's going better, if it's going worse. The rule of law index, which was just cited, is a perception indicator. So it's basically how people perceive that the world is going. And people tend to be very pessimistic at the moment. And therefore, every year for the past three years, the team of the index gives us this warning, I think this year, 73% uh, of the population lives in countries without rule of law or where rule of law is actually deteriorating. And this in itself, if this 73% would be a hardcore figure, but it's not, that's what I'm arguing. But if it were, it would mean that less than a third of the world is trying to sell the rule of law, to promote the rule of law to the rest. So this in itself shows the enormity of this challenge. Would we succeed like a quarter of the world to impose this to the rest of the world which doesn't have it? Obviously, this is going to be difficult. The third reason is that we really miss a policy a model applicable in practice. What would this mean, an actionable model? It means that we understand and know how something that you put in a constitution, a formal institution, turns into practice. If you look at the constitutions, both Germany and Kazakhstan have very similar institutions when rule of law are concerned. But I bet that if you are arrested in a country, you would prefer to be in Germany and not in Kazakhstan. So between the Jure and de facto, what is written in laws and how this translates into practice, there are a number of factors which explain these differential outcomes. And these factors, this is why we're social scientists, we have to explain through a model. And we do not have a good model. We do not have a good model accepted by all of us on how the Jure becomes de facto. 
what our industry, because I would really call it an industry, we have you know, sold similar institutions all over the world. If you look how many ombudsmen the world has now, how many whistleblower protection legislations, uh, how many similar institutions in the judiciary, you would see that the world is really nearly there. But what has increased dramatically while we did this is the gap between the URE, where people aligned, and de facto, the impact of this legislation. And this is something that you know, we need to fill with evidence to understand how it works. Finally, uh, in the rule of law promotion is really very difficult since, again, we have only perception indicators. And since, again, we don't have similar definitions, so it's really difficult to enforce unitary standards. And since it's such a politically sensitive field, not enforcing unitary standards is politically very costly, and that's another reason why we stumble a little bit with it. Finally, the conclusion of, of my book, uh, Europe's Burden, this time, is that the record is not good presently. I just give the Turkish example in the book, in the year when Mr. Erdogan arrested tens of people from the judicial police because they were investigating his government for corruption. The EU uh, re monitoring, report, monitoring report of Turkey said that the, both the judicial plan of action, both the corruption plan and action are on good track. And the only danger to them is perhaps the lack of personnel, since so many persecutors have been fired by Mr. Erdogan. So we haven't done a great job so far. Also, you would not be surprised to know that Turkey has been the largest recipient of rule of law funds. Only on Turkey, the European Union spent more than a billion trying to bring Turkey into rule of law. And when we started, Turkey was a democracy, at least an electoral democracy, and now you see what, what it is. So not a fabulous record so far. Now, of course, you know, uh, it's not that the, all the news are bad. Judicial independence matters, and we can see in the news that it matters. We can see that people fight for it every day. And this is very encouraging, right? In a country like Kenya, Every election is fought at the electoral court. The court practically decisively each time has to decide if the elections were correct or not. I mean, the same is in every court, except that here it's really disputed, and they really risk their lives. The elections depend as much as the court as on the vote. There are other countries, however, where we see us losing the battle. India used to be as strong as Kenya when the judiciary was concerned. You could rely on the judiciary to protect the Indian democracy. India has lost the status of free country from Freedom House in the past two years. And the main reason why this happened is the fact that judicial institutions are now more and more openly politically subordinated. So, we know that this matters. We see people putting out a fight. There are places where we win this fight and there are significant places like India where we obviously are losing it. Okay, but judicial independence is just a part of rule of law definition, unfortunately, okay? Because at least judicial independence is clear and we understand what we mean. I personally prefer the definition of the Global Competitiveness Report, which defines judicial independence as independence from both government and private interest, right? Because the judges should not be bought by other people, by corporations or by whoever bribes courts. Rule of law, however, is really a multifold concept. And if you see here what is in this rule of law index, right? You will see that rule of law index considers rule of law to be have access and affording of legal service, effectively enforce so enforcement, uh, discrimination, lack of corruption, lack of improper judicial influence, and functioning, effectiveness of the judiciary, which is rather a lot. Now, if we look at 
you know, the nominal definition, I use here the Stephen Voigt one, but they're all fairly similar. You see that rule of law is supposed to mean separation of power, judicial reviews, judicial independence, judicial accountability, prosecutorial independence, fair trials, basic human rights, plus rule abidance by citizens. But even just by looking at this list without going in depth, you see that, for instance, judicial review, whom I love because in my life I have been educated in the United States of America and I've always been a democracy promotion girl. I sit on the border of Journal of Democracy and I unashamedly try to change the regime in my country and contributed to regime change in whatever countries civil societies invited me and wanted my advice. So judicial review is a very strong weapon that we use. It basically means that courts can sanction the acts of the legislative. So by itself, judicial review is a breach of the separation of powers, right? And we see a lot of it these days, and I'm going to try to explain why this definition of rule of law is challenging. It is because there is no full consistency between all these elements. If we would be able to turn them into some measurement system, and we can do that, to some of them, they would not correlate very well. So my main argument is that we evolved from a rule of law which used to mean 30 years ago just separation of powers and simply the fact that law is sovereign to a very advanced activistic judicial review driven conception of the rule of law, where actually policies and values of the governments, elected governments, are very constantly challenged in courts by activists like me, which is what I do. I build coalitions in my country and wherever else there are collective action problems, okay? But let's not start by presuming that these coalitions always reflect uh, the majority view of the country. We are in a era where we fight with populists. What is popul what are, who are populists? Well, there are other people who do not think like us. These are basically who the populists are, and who sometimes have the very bad idea of having political parties and leaders whom they elect to government, and who promote values fairly different from ours, what we consider as rule of law. So this concept is like a basket. We put all of this into this. And this creates a number of issues. What values underpinning the rule of law concept are more important? The procedural values, I mean like the old common law traditions that you know, World Bank developers love so much, uh, contract enforcement, due process, this is what matter, or substantial values. For instance, equality, equality between genders, equality between sexual orientations. These are very hard questions to answer. It used to be procedural values, but now increasingly it is substantial values. Of course, the next question is who decide what values these are? What if we do not have in consensus in our societies? Europe is not a uniform place. Do believe me that peasants in Poland or peasants in Romania do not believe, I mean, I used to do public opinion surveys and always looked at very different landscapes in urban and rural, for instance, right? We don't have the same value. Still, we have to have the same rule of law for everybody. Of course, in my life, I always liked Francis Fukuyama definition from his World Order Bible book in two volumes. And his definition is simplicity itself. It basically says that rule of law means that rulers have to live with the law of previous government. And if they start changing the law, that is bad. However, in my book, Transitions to Good Governance, the foremost example of the most successful judicial reform ever is Estonia's 90s Prime Minister, Mart Lahr, who entirely changed the legislation from Soviet times and fired all the judges. He suspended all, laws, all 
trials, all, all courts for six months, because they had to get new people out of law school and get new retired lawyers, lawyers who had been active before Soviet Union, in order to man the system. Because he simply considered that somebody who was a judge in Soviet times, just executing political orders, you know, the communist systems were organized with the political nomenclaturist on top. Underneath him was the prosecutor, who was the most powerful person in the judicial system. Underneath was the policeman, and down to the bottom was the judge. The judge was just told by all this letter about him what to do and how to judge. And Mart Lahr judged that this has to change entirely, and if you are socialized in such a system, you will not be able to have rule of law. But this definitely goes against Fukuyama's definition, right? So we have to acknowledge that there are countries where sometimes you need to do a radical reform. And these days, one of the things that European Union is promoting more openly is vetting of the judiciary. We have done this in Albania, and we're now doing it in Republic of Moldova. So countries where EU actually directs the reform of the judiciary. I could even say it dictates from top down. And of course, it's people like me who made Estonia, uh, give Estonia such a publicity as a success story who has promoted this. But that obviously doesn't fall into Fukuyama's definition. So that definition is not very helpful either. Okay. On good governance and public integrity, the world is much simpler. This is what I've been working for the past 20 years. And here we have the actionable model, because here we have consistency across the items. Good governance is just a balance, a balance between opportunities for corruption, for basically partial allocation of public resources in a society, and public integrity, which is government on the basis of equality, equal and impartial treatment for the broadest social welfare possible. Imagine this as the two ends of the continuum. And we know very well what creates constraints and what creates opportunities. And from our methodological point of view, that's a very good situation because if I put the proxies, the measurements that I make for opportunity, which are power discretion and material resources, such as mineral resources, right? Oil and all this, into one basket with constraints. Constraints being how independent judiciary and bureaucracy is from the elected government or from whoever rules the country. How strong is society, civil society, media? If we put all this into one basket, you know, and we run some statistical trick, which is called factor analysis, they all come together. So only one component exists. So good governance, or governance, if you want, because it's two ends of the continuum, good or bad, is just one continuum, is just one latent variable in which everything, judicial independence, press freedom, quality of administration, quality of legislation, it all comes into place. That means that we can create an index, and this is my index of public integrity, because everything is consistent internally and correlated. And this is why we do not have a similar fact-based index on rule of law, because we can't. The rule of law components are simply not correlated. I cannot extract a principal component there. You see here the map of public integrity, so which is based on this model that I described to you, factors coming together to determine this equilibrium, which is control of corruption. In the end of the day, for the sake of measurement, control of corruption or public integrity, as I call it, and uh, rule of law correlate at 95%. So measuring one, you measure another. They're not similar, but they're very close from obvious reasons, right? The judicial independence is part of both, for instance. Or you really cannot have rule of law if you have a captured state with particularistic instead of universalistic allocation. Okay, this is on corruptionrisk.org. And the colors, you know, what is different between perception indicators and this index is that you can see exactly if you go here, why a country has the rank that it has. What a country does well and what a country does good. What do they do well? 
let's say, uh, fiscal transparency or freedom of the press, or they have a high number of digital citizens which, who are empowered and contribute to good governance. So you can see out of these elements what creates, generates the color that you see there, which respects the color convention of green good and dark red very bad with everything in, in between. So in Europe, the, the darker countries, the darker a country it is, the better it is. Also, we have a clear, actionable model of transparency. We understand how transparency works and how the Euro and de facto transparency connects. And we didn't have this 10 years ago. So I'm just giving an example that we did evolve in terms of collecting evidence and having actionable models, right? But where did we evolve? We evolved on public integrity and we evolved on transparency. What you see here is another balance, is how transparency actually helps the balance that I showed you before. Transparency decreases opportunities or resources for corruption in all the areas, fiscal, administrative, natural resources, and we can have policies, and we do have policies in all of this, and also increases constraints, because it enables journalists, it even enables prosecutors, you know. Prosecutors do their jobs easier if they can find the information online rather than, you know, writing to another government department. So we know, we know some things how this works. However, on rule of law, things are far more complicated. Let me give you the example of the country that I now lived in, because I moved from Berlin to Italy last year. So I am now professor of public policy in Roma. Big news the last week is that the migration policy of the government was basically reversed by a court, by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that we cannot send these migrants to Albania to have their applications for political asylum rejected because their countries of origins are not safe and the government cannot just decide that it's safe in order to, to get rid of them, right? But is this really rule of law? I mean, of course we would say yes, they're applying international conventions of human rights, which is above all the constitutions. But in effect, it goes against a major policy of government and you realize that what it creates, it's a major conflict between the judicial and the executive. Look what happened to Israel in the past three, four years. In Israel, increasingly, when the Netanyahu government, due to the fact that they needed the support of parties more to the right, they increasingly tried to pass more identity-based legislation. This was, of course, very strongly challenged by public opinion, and it was systematically reversed by their top court. Seeing that this happens and that the government simply cannot enact these partial policies, they resorted to reform the top court. And when they resorted to reform the top court, the country was simply paralyzed by people who came out to defend judicial review, the right of court to sanction government policy. This created not only a major conflict, but I've read papers created paralysis, really, because this whole thing was very strongly within the military, was very strongly within secret services, so Israel really was paralysed by this fight over its rule of law uh, when Hamas struck a year ago. Fundamental misunderstanding and explaining why Netanyahu is so strongly fighting against courts. Coming closer to home within our borders, right? What is Mr. Sanchez, the, the Spanish Prime Minister, trying to do? Mr. Sanchez is trying to do the same. He is trying to curtail the institution that I say in my Transitions to Good Governance book that is by itself accountable for Chile's extraordinary exception in Latin America. Why has Chile been in the green for the past 30 years? only followed by Uruguay in Latin America. Because in the 1930s, Chile adopted extraordinary measures in favor of independence of the judiciary, among which the decision that people in the Supreme Court nominations have to be approved by two-thirds of the Senate. 
meaning that no partisan group can appoint judges in the Supreme Court. And this in itself, nobody, not even Pinochet, touched and helped them have an independent judiciary in periods of you know, different quality in, in quality of democracy. This is what Mr. Sanchez tries to remove. The argument he makes is the same argument that we heard in Poland, is that, oh, but these judges are there from Franco's time in the same way that Kaczynski say, that, oh, judges are there from communist times. Perfectly true, but if they've been there for 30 years of democratic transition, when this country was considered rule of law, it's not the government who should now reform the judiciary and decides who gets there and takes care to be able to do this with a simple majority, by one vote, right? But we don't have you know, enough discussions about Mr. Sanchez. I was happy to see an article in The Economist the other week. But other than that, he's getting off very, very lightly, you know, because discussion in the European media about who does what depends very much on the effectiveness of opposition to lobby Brussels and the Brussels-based media to attract attention about what goes in a country. And that varies widely. United States, right? The country for where judicial review came. What goes on in United States? In United States, we have reversals of policies, not only because Mr. Trump appoints judges. Of course, that's the easiest explanations, but American presidents have always appointed judges. But why is Mr. Trump there in the, in the first place? It's because a significant part of population has now shifted to conservative values. And the court is now so conservative that they reversed this abortion decision of, of 30 years ago. Finally, the countries where we are influential, well, we come top down and tell people what to do, right? Albania, the externally sponsored vetting in Albania. Now, depending to who you talk, it's either an unqualified success, it must be a success, or we would not take it over to Ukraine and Moldova right, to do the same thing. But in fact, we have, you know, very informed opinions which tell us that what happens is that since the opposition did not participate in this process, basically the government was able to select judges using this integrity and end up with partisan judges. Judges appointed by only one part of the political spectrum. Now you're going to say, but this doesn't really matter. What's important is that they're non-corrupt. And I'm going to tell you, no, you know, in systematically corrupt countries, everyone is corrupt. So I would rather have them corrupt, but non-partisan, because chances that they will put only the other people systematically in jail, they're going to be lower. Okay, so in this rule of law thing, we have to rather be concerned about uh, not infringing on democracy rather than, you know, if they're corrupt or not. We start from the presumption that everybody is corrupt. At least in my country, this was always the case. Finally, Moldova. Moldova had a referendum, right, these days on, the, on joining the European Union. And you may have noticed that they won this referendum by 13,000 votes. And you're going to ask yourself, what is the matter, you know, with these people? Well, the short answer is, it's complicated. You know, aside the fact that they have Russian speakers and that they have a breakaway region which still has Russian army, leaving this aside, aside the fact that they themselves say about themselves that 180,000 votes were sold, you know, but they were sold because they were for sale, right? It's such a poor country that people do sell their votes and they sell their votes to this Moscow-based oligarch. But aside this, you know, Moldova, it's part of its EU integration, trying to implement anti-corruption and reinforce its judiciary. When the pro-EU guys came to government, the first thing they did, they tried to fire the general prosecutor. Now, this may sound outrageous to you in Helsinki, but I, in my life, have been at least twice part of the same attempt in Romania. I mean, it's unavoidable. Reformers come to government, and you find there the prosecutor, general prosecutor, who basically reflects the position of the corrupt government that you are voted to change. So what do you do, you know? But luckily in Romania, we managed to be Democrats. We were really bad on a number of other things, but we remained Democrats. 
Okay, so what did we do with the two general prosecutors? My first situation is in 1997, the second situation is in 2005. Well, they were appointed consuls and ambassadors in order to leave kindly and leave to us the, this vacant position in order to put someone to implement new policy. But what did Moldova do? First, they fired him, although they didn't constitutionally couldn't do this. And second, when he wouldn't go, they arrested him. And this guy was now the main contender in presidential elections against pro-European President Maya Sandu, because of course he won in Strasbourg at the European Court of Human Rights, and he's strong with a lot of decisions. He's now a martyr, you know. He's a post-Soviet martyr. In fact, the representative of the country in Europe with the most corrupt judges, which is Moldova, where the judiciary is like a money laundering machine for the entire Soviet system, right? But there it is. We try to win the battle against them by the standards which are their standards, and it backfired. Finally, I think that Poland is the best example close to us, where we see how difficult it is, right? The pro-rule of law party won in Poland, but now everybody is upset with them. For instance, the, they didn't manage to reverse the anti-abortion legislation because unfortunately, uh, parties are afraid of losing their constituencies and unfortunately this reflects a renewed conservatism in the Polish society, which was never very liberal to start with. But where did we go, you know, in order to enforce in Poland? I think Poland has been the object of the strongest enforcement of rule of law. Mrs. von der Leyen, in fact, threatened they will cut their EU funds if cities do not accept LGBT marriages. Okay, I mean, of course, they were outrageous to try to create LGBT-free zones, but to understand that mayors do this because their constituencies are very conservative. They were elected to do this, right? And law of justice never tricked any elections. They have been in power for so long because they are based on a system of alliances of very conservative values. Nobody, I can tell you, told its Polish peasants when, Polon uh, when Poland joined in 2004 that rule of law actually means that marriage between LGBT people is the same as with marriage with straight people, because they would not be here with us. They just don't believe this. So when we had a referendum on LGBT marriage in Romania two, three days ago, when people were giving us advice in Brussels, I was sort of telling people, please just don't speak about this. Please don't interfere about this. People don't care about this. People are rational. The more we mobilize them, the more we're going to help the conservatives. Let us play it. And you're going to see that nobody's going to come out of houses. We're never going to reach the threshold, and the referendum will foil. Please do not awake the conservative demons of these still poor and rural societies. Because if you look at the map of public opinion, you will see that our societies in Eastern Europe are not so different from Russia. Of course, we hate Russia because oh, traditionally they occupied us. I have grandparents who returned from Siberia and the rest. But we're not so different now. I mean, we're closer to the West. But so, if we extend rule of law to mean all that, the question is, do we really have so many troops to occupy all, all, all these countries? And they put this, the more substance, the more difficult. The more procedural, the easier to enforce and show clearer standards and base it all on a clear contract. Okay. So you will maybe want to ask yourselves when, when this, I mean, how can I put all these things together? They're together. In fact, the difficulty is how to separate this, how to separate rule of law and control of corruption. You know, historically as political development, the first thing achieved is control of violence. Then you have this basic rule of law, the thin rule of law, the rights and the effective regulatory environment, and then the most refined things come, control of corruption, accountability of government, and this universal ethical-based citizenship, which has never been reached anywhere, but some countries are, of course, closer than others. And what I like, and I find very encouraging in my work, is that 186 countries in the world adopted United Nations Convention Against Corruption. 
unlike when the Human Rights Convention was adopted, you may remember that at the time there were exceptions formulated, that Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iran said that there are no universal human rights, and amendments should be made to accommodate the Islamic view of rights. But not, no such things in 2004 when we adopted this Anti-Corruption Convention. And the Anti-Corruption Convention is the Bible of ethical universalism because it doesn't define corrup con corruption at all. It just says that government has to be impartial on the interests of everybody, that it has to consult everybody, that it has to operate on the basis of full transparency, right? So it's roughly a list of what good government is. And 186 countries ratified without being bullied, without being occupied, without being anything. So I think it is the end of relativism in good governance. And that makes me easy. I promote this. I even promote this in a substantive part. I don't promote it actually so much on the tools part because I think every country should find its tools and we shouldn't have a universal set of things. But that is easy, okay? It's part of rule of law, but it's made easy for us. It's no controversial and clearly corresponds to the values of everybody. The reason why this works, of course, is that it's practical. You know, I don't make the argument on rule of law that uh, I don't make a normative argument. I make a practical argument that I take. The practical argument is that there is no way to organize a government unless you organize a government by equal treatment. This is uh, an argument made by a lawyer, Roman lawyer called Cicero, who said the Republic, it's an association of rights. If people do not believe that we should organize this on the basis of equality, they should come up with another principle on the basis of which we can organize it. And I run this exercise with students and we never manage to find a good principle. I keep it as an open discussion. Let's think, how else should we organize the Republic? Into men and women, immediately impracticalities appear. Into ages, the most senior people should rule the younger, again, immediately impracticalities appear. So we have to do it as an equal thing. And this is fairly understood today. It's no longer questioned by anybody. It's become part of what a philosopher called James Wilson calls the moral sense. Ethical universalism, that is what we promote. And rule of law and control of corruption meet here because rule of law is ethical universalism applied to law, equal and impartial treatment by courts to everybody while public integrity is ethical university applied to social allocation. Basically, public resources distributed equally on the basis of merit to all citizens, companies, whatever. But the two models, when we put together, they are rather different. So one is clear, the other one is really blurred. Now, if you would travel to this website of mine, EuropaMEU, the only one in Europe to, to show legislation, public accountability legislation and quantify it so that you can put it out on maps. The darker the shade, the more regulation a country has. So what you see here is conflict of interest regulation. And if you look, you will see that Poland is wonderfully regulated. Just look a little bit north and you see that Poland is far better regulated than Finland, right? And I can show you the same for Hungary, and Finland, you see here a red line, which is the country, and then you see the blue line, which is the European average of regulation. And Hungary is exceeding European regulation in everything, right? I have public procurement, conflict of interest, lots of it. While Finland is below European average in absolutely everything, except one thing, transparency where it really exceeds a lot. And it does seem that this one thing delivers the fact that Finland definitely is on top of all my charts while Poland and Hungary are doing badly. But this is what I call a model to explain the connection between the Jure and de facto and greatly influences our work because our work mostly consists in asking Mr. Orban to adopt this or this institution, create this and this agency. And of course he does it because he knows it doesn't matter. 
Nothing will change, right? But we have all this, this is evidence. This has been around for some years, right? What you see here is the gap between the euro and the facto for 140 countries on my transparency index. Now, how do I do the facto? And here I say, welcome to our new generation of indicators, because digitalization allows us to directly observe the world. Some things which used to be hidden are no longer hidden. So what I do is that I have a 14 items list based on United Nations Convention Against Corruption, what websites and what information a country should have to allow every citizen to defend himself from discrimination and corruption. Because favoritism creates discrimination, right? When I give someone a favor, I take this from somewhere else, unless I'm in Qatar where I have unlimited resources. And, uh, you know, I pay everybody's rents and scholarships, but even in Qatar, foreign workers pay a price, right? There is no country of unlimited resources, and therefore corruption creates discrimination. So, what should countries have? Well, they should have all information of companies, shareholders, publish all judicial motivations, publish the land cadaster, have all the information out there so that people do not need to bribe someone to get it, and defend themselves. And when we do this and compare this with the regulation on transparency, because we have a lot of rules, money laundering, we have a lot of rules, we can calculate a de jure transparency and a de facto transparency. And what you see here on top is the de jure in gray and underneath the de facto. And of course, in Europe and North America, there's a very small gap Basically, what we do is we also have the means, right? Because this is a bit expensive. This is internet-based transparency. But if you look in sub-Saharan Africa, you see that they actually have a big de jure. They adopted a lot of stuff. But then, de facto, you see the small red line. This is where our promotion work is, OK? We succeeded in de jure. Everyone adopted the norm of ethical universalism, everyone adopted UNCAC, everyone adopts money laundering directives, extractive transparency initiative, whatever we throw at them, will end up by being adopted by someone. How many of them actually will be put into practice and will have an impact? Far fewer. And this, of course, we come to, and I can show you here in the T-index what countries have and what countries don't. You see that Nearly everybody publishes from 140 countries, publishes laws digitally, which is great because people should know the laws applying to them, right? Quite a lot of countries today publish judicial sentences, which again is fabulous. In Africa, many countries do that. Many countries now publish mining concessions, so there's been some progress, okay? But also there are areas where there's very little, you know. Uh, land cadaster and property is fundamental in helping people defend themselves and in deterring corruption. Uh, online disclosures of public expenditure, being able to track public expenditures. Very few countries do it, although donors insist in public financial management and all this. And here it is. Here is our actionable agenda. Everything which is in yellow or orange, we have to do we have to fill in in the next times. It's very easy to say transparency is not sufficient. Of course it's not sufficient, but it's also insufficient transparency. And that is the job of development cooperation. That's uncontroversial, well, it doesn't go against the regime, and can be done, okay? So, I end with this. My advice after having been on all sides of this struggle, so I have been an anti-corruption activist leading all coalitions in my country. I work to change regimes, Balkans, Ukraine, wherever. I've been a scholar looking at good governance promotion, and of course I've been an expert for various European institutions, Commission, European Court of Editors, Parliament. So I think that uh, we should promote clear things, because promoting rule of law is a unitary concept we risk basically saying that we like a regime in Poland or we dislike a regime in Poland. We had a bit of that, but we're gonna have more than that. Look at the Spanish case. So we have to be very specific in our promotion. Of course we should, you know, we can call it rule of law, but let's say exactly 
what do we mean, right? And what do we mean is judicial independence, human rights, and public integrity. The second is that we have to get de facto, not de jure. And this means that we good promotion is a, has to rely on theories of change which explain to us how to get where we want to get from where we are here. And we do produce measurements for the promoters to use. That's our job. We promote the measurements and you go on with the promotion, if that's what you want to do. Double standards need to be eliminated, right? Either we are able to sell to people what we do and what we all do in EU, EU institutions and member states, or let's just stop it. It's highly, highly detrimental as we have seen in Moldova, right? So the top corrupt guy whom we try to eliminate is now the main contender and our pro-EU referendum nearly fails in a few thousand votes. We need to mind the unintended consequences and the trade-offs. We simply cannot go on doing anti-corruption, sacrificing due process. I mean, I have been in the struggle. I think you should be creative. Definitely, we're not going to go and... But, you know, even the most obvious things, like what we should promote are the preventive policies. You know, we should sort of try to drag the carpet from under their feet before they do it. How can we even imagine that in Ukraine, where the judiciary, which has always been the the low spot of the country. The judiciary in Ukraine is like the judiciary in Moldova, that we're going to solve the Ukrainian corruption by the judiciary. How can something which is a problem become part of a solution? That's a problem. Let's plan to solve it the next 15 years. But corruption should simply not be handled by courts. Okay, we have to prevent it by systematic reform, as Martlar did in Estonia. It's not that we don't know how to do it. Some people did it. They are in my book. Finally, we need to have positive incentives for people to put things into practice. Piling up regulation, you know, I do it systematically. I ask my students for their thesis to assess European regulation. So we looked at the directive of public procurement, for instance, the directives for public procurement, which are very good. Except that if you look even on the Commission website, where we now have risk indicators for this, you are going to see that risk indicators for corruption in public procurement deteriorated in most Europe, except Netherlands and Scandinavian countries, when? After the adoption of the directive. Does this mean that the directive is to blame? Of course not. It's the pandemics to blame and the number of other things which created opportunities for corruption. But it also means that piling up new regulations in the area of procurement is not helpful. Let's try to understand why this directive, which was not a bad directive, was not implemented nearly everywhere. I think Croatia is the only country which uh, improved. And of course, I had a student do a thesis especially on Croatia, and Croatians took care to tell him that they just game the indicators, they just trick the indicators and not even them improve. Finally, learn from one another. Some people really manage to do things. They're not many, but they do exist. Rather than going with a prescription manual from one country to another, as the European Commission does, saying, oh, we have to do this in Ukraine because it worked in Romania. Well, why don't they ask me? I did it in Romania. I mean, they do ask me, but they don't like what I say. I say, no, no, it's not sustainable. It worked only in the, Ukraine is a violent context. You put people to risk it. You know, I, I don't dare, you know, USAID asks me to launch their anti-kleptocracy manual where only Romania and I don't know who else, South Korea are, are good examples. And I said, you know how, how smart you were not to send me to review this because then we would have nothing to launch today instead of just calling me when it's a, when it's a fait accompli, right? So we don't have success stories. We have to understand the success stories. We have, however, some success people who did things, people like Martlar, who is still around. And we should ask them, we should learn from them. And this is the agenda of my project. What my project is going to do, generously funding six million by DG Research, for whom I also worked as an expert for many years, is to look at implementation gaps. We are doing exactly this. We are trying to understand uh, the gaps in regulation and in particular the gaps in enforcement and implementation. We are systematically looking at quite a lot of European regulation, and what I'm, you know, looking really scaringly that now EU adopts a new anti-corruption package. 
right? So before we manage to assess the old regulation, the money laundering, the assets freezing, the everything which is there, we're already going to have a bunch of, of regulation on our hands when we already know that the results are diverse and we need strategies to get impact. Because what we want is impact, you know. Nobody wants a republic made of laws. We have a splendid Terence Roman saying which says the most corrupt republics have the most laws. Thank you.